Chapter 28. Catelyn. My lady, you ought to cover your head, Sir Roderick told her as their horses plodded north. You will take a chill. It is only water, Sir Roderick, Catelyn replied. Her hair hung wet and heavy, a loose strand stuck to her forehead, and she could imagine how ragged and wild she must look. But for once she did not care. The southern rain was soft and warm. Catelyn liked the feel of it on her face, gentle as a mother's kisses. It took her back to childhood, to long gray days at River Run. She remembered the god's wood, drooping branches heavy with moisture, and the sound of her brother's laughter as he chased her through piles of damp leaves. She remembered making mud pies with Lysa, the weight of them, the mud slick and brown between her fingers. They had served them to Littlefinger, giggling, and he'd eaten so much mud he was sick for a week. How young they had all been. Catelyn had almost forgotten. In the north, the rain fell cold and hard. Sometimes at night it turned to ice. It was as likely to kill a crop as nurture it, and it sent grown men running for the nearest shelter. That was no rain for little girls to play in. I'm soaked through, Sir Roderick complained. Even my bones are wet. The woods pressed close around them, and the steady pattering of rain on leaves was accompanied by the small sucking sounds their horses made as their hooves pulled free of the mud. We all want a fire tonight, my lady, and a hot meal would serve us both. There is an inn at the crossroads up ahead, Catelyn told him. She had slept many a night there in her youth, traveling with her father, Lord Hoster Tully. He had been a restless man in his prime, always riding somewhere. She still remembered the innkeep, a fat woman named Masha Heddle, who chewed sour leaf night and day, and seemed to have an endless supply of smiles and sweet cakes for the children. The sweet cakes had been soaked with honey, rich and heavy on the tongue. But how Catelyn had dreaded those smiles. The sour leaf had stained Masha's teeth a dark red, and made her smile a bloody horror. An inn, Sir Roderick replied wistfully. If only. But we dare not risk it. If we wish to remain unknown, I think it best we seek out some small hold fast. He broke off as they heard sounds up the road. Splashing water, the clink of mail, a horse's whinny. Riders, he warned, his hand dropping to the hilt of his sword. Even on the king's road, it never hurt to be wary. They followed the sounds around a lazy bend of the road and saw them, a column of armed men noisily fording a swollen stream. Catelyn reined up to let them pass. The banner in the hand of the foremost rider hung sodden and limp, but the guardsmen wore indigo cloaks, and on their shoulders flew the silver e eagle of Seaguard. Malisters, Sir Roderick whispered to her, as if she had not known. My lady, best pull up your hood. Catelyn made no move. Lord Jason Malister himself rode with them, surrounded by his knights, his son Patrick by his side, and their squires close behind. They were riding for King's Landing and the Hand's Tourney, she knew. For the past week, the travelers had been thick as flies upon the King's Road. Knights and free riders, singers with their harps and drums, heavy wagons la laden with hops or corn or casks of honey, traders and craftsmen and whores, and all of them moving south. She studied Lord Jason boldly. The last time she had seen him, he had been jesting with her uncle at their wedding feast. The Malisters stood bannermen to the Tullys, and his gifts had been lavish. His brown hair was salted with white now, his face chiseled gaunt by the time, yet the years had not touched his pride. He rode like a man who feared nothing. Catelyn envied him that. She had come to fear so much. As the riders passed, Lord Jason nodded a curt greeting, but it was only a high lord's courtesy to strangers chance met on the road. There was no recognition in those fierce eyes and his son did not waste a look. "'He did not know you,' Sir Roderick said after, wondering. He saw a pair of mud-spattered travelers by the side of the road, wet and tired. It would never occur to him to suspect that one of them was the daughter of his liege lord. "'I think we shall be safe enough at the inn, Sir Roderick.' It was near dark when they reached it, at the crossroads north of the great confluence of the Trident. Masha Heddle was fatter and grayer than Catelyn remembered, still chewing her sour leaf, but she gave them only the most cursory of looks, with nary a hint at her ghastly red smile. Two rooms at the top of the stair! That's all there is!' she said, chewing all the while. "'They're under the bell tower. You won't be missing meals. Though their sons thinks it too noisy. Can't be helped. We're full up, or near as makes no matter. It's those rooms of the road!' 
It was those rooms. Low, dusty garrets at the top of a cramped, narrow staircase. Leave your boots down here, Masha told them after they after she'd taken their coin. The boy will clean them. Yeah, I won't have you tracking mud up me stairs. Mind the bell. Those who come late to meals don't eat. There were no smiles, and no mention of sweet cakes. When the supper bell rang, the sound was deafening. Catelyn had changed into dry clothes. She sat by the window, watching rain run down the pane. The glass was milky and full of bubbles, and a wet dusk was falling outside. Catelyn could just make out the muddy crossing where the two great roads met. The crossroads gave her pause. If they turned west from here, it was an easy ride down to River Run. Her father had always given her wise counsel when she needed it most, and she yearned to talk to him, to warn him of the gathering storm. If Winterfell needed to brace for war, how much more so River Run? So much closer to King's Landing, with the power of Casterly Rock looming to the west like a shadow. If only her father had been stronger, she might have chanced it. But Hoster Tully had been bedridden in these past two years, and Catelyn was loath to tax him now. The eastern road was wilder and more dangerous, climbing through rocky footholds and thick forests into the mountains of the moon, past high passes and deep chasms of, to the Vale of Arryn and the stony fingers beyond. Above the Vale, the Eyrie stood high and impregnable, its towers reaching for the sky. There she would find her sister, and perhaps some of the answers Ned sought. Surely Lysa knew more than she had dared put in her letter. She might have the very proof that Ned ne needed to bring the Lannisters to ruin, and if it came to war, she would ne they would need the Aarons and the Eastern Lords who owed them service. Yet the mountain road was perilous. Shadow cats prowled those passes, rock slides were common, and the mountain clans were lawless brigands descending from the heights to rob and kill and melting away like snow whenever the knights rode out from the vale in search of them. Even John Arryn, as great a lord as any the Eyrie had ever known, had always traveled in strength when he crossed the mountains. Catelyn's only strength was one elderly knight, armored in loyalty. No, she thought, River Run and the Eyrie would have to wait. Her path ran north to Winterfell, where her sons and her duty were waiting for her. As soon as her, they were safely past the Neck, she could declare herself to one of Ned's bannermen and send riders bracing ahead with orders to mount a watch on the King's Road. The rain obscured the fields beyond the crossroads, but Catelyn saw the land clear enough in her memory. The marketplace was just across the way, and the village a mile further on, half a hundred white cottages surrounding a small stone sept. There would be more now. The summer had been long and peaceful. North of here, the King's Road ran along the green forks of the Trident through, through fertile valleys and green woodlands, past thriving towns and stout holdfasts and the castles of the river lords. Catelyn knew them all, the Blackwoods and the Brackens, ever enemies, whose quarrels her father was obliged to settle. Lady Went, last of her line, who dwelt in her, with her ghosts in the cavernous vaults of Harrenhal. Irascible Lord Frey, who had outlived seven wives and filled his twin castles with children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, and bastards and grandbastards as well. All of them were bannermen to the Tullys, their swords sworn to the service of River Run. Catelyn wondered if that would be enough if it came to war. Her father was the staunchest man who'd ever lived, and she had no doubt that he would call his banners. But would the banners come? The Darys and Rigers and Mutons had sworn oath to River Run as well, yet they had fought with Rhaegar Targaryen on the Trident, while Lord Frey had arrived with his enemies well after the battle was over, leaving some doubt as to which army he had planned to join. Theirs, he had assured the victors solemnly in the aftermath, but ever after her father had called him the late Lord Frey. It must not come to war, Catelyn thought fervently. They must not let it. Sir Roderick came for her just as the bell ceased its clangor. We had best make haste if we hope to eat tonight, my lady. It might be safer if we were not knight and lady until we pass the neck, she told him. Common travelers attract less notice. A father and daughter taken on to the road on some family business, say. As you say, my lady, Sir Roderick agreed. It was only when she laughed that he realized what he'd done. Yeah, old courtesies die hard, my... my daughter. He tried to tug on his missing, missing whiskers and sighed with exasperation. Catelyn took his arm. Come, father, she said. 
You'll find that Masha Heddle sets a good table, I think. But try not to praise her. You truly don't want to see her smile. The common room was long and drafty, with a row of huge wooden kegs at one end and a fireplace at the other. A serving boy ran back and forth with skewers of meat, while Masha drew beer from the kegs, chewing her sour leaf all the while. The benches were crowded, townsfolk and farmers mingling freely with all manner of travelers. The crossroads made for odd companions. Dyers with black and purple hands shared a bench with rivermen reeking of fish. An ironsmith thick with muscle squeezed in beside a wizened old, wizened old septum. Hard-bitten sellswords and soft, plump merchants swapped news like boon companions. The company included more swords than Catelyn would have liked. Three by the fire wore the red stallion badge of the Brackens, and there was a large party in blue steel ringmail and capes of a silvery gray. On their shoulders was another familiar sigil, the twin towers of House Frey. She studied their faces, but they were all too young to have known her. The senior among them would have been no older than Bran when she went north. Sir Roderick found them an empty place on the bench near the kitchen. Across the table, a handsome youth was fingering a wood harp. Seven blessings to you, good folk,' he said as they sat. An empty wine cup stood on the table before him. "'And to you, singer,' Catelyn returned. Sir Roderick called for bread and meat and beer in a tone that meant now. The singer, a youth of some eighteen years, eyed them boldly and asked where they were going and from whence they had come and what news they had, letting the questions fly as thick as arrows and never pausing for an answer. "'We left King's Landing a fortnight ago,' Catelyn replied, answering the safest of his questions. "'That's where I'm bound,' the youth said." As she had suspected, he was more interested in telling his own story than in hearing theirs. Singers loved nothing half so well as the sound of their own voices. The hand's tourney means rich lords with fat purses. The last time I came away with more silver than I could carry, or would have if I hadn't lost it all betting on the kingslayer to win the day. The gods frown on the gambler, Sir Roderick said sternly. He was of the north and shared the stark views on tournaments. They frowned on me for certain, the singer said. Your cruel gods and the night of the flowers altogether did me in. No doubt there was a lesson for you, Sir Roderick said. It was. This time my corn will champion Sir Loras. Sir Roderick tried to tug at whiskers that were not there, but before he could frame a rebuke, the serving boy came scurrying in. He laid trenchers of bread before them and filled them with chunks of brown meat off a skewer, dripping with hot juice. Another skewer held tiny onions, fire peppers, and fat mushrooms. Sir Roderick set to lustily, and the lad ran back to, sir, to fetch them beer. "'My name is Marillion,' the singer said, plucking a string on his wood harp. "'Doubtless you've heard me play somewhere?' His manner made Catelyn smile. Few wandering singers ever ventured as far, ventured as far north as Winterfell, but she knew his like from her girlhood in River Run. I fear not, she told him. He drew a plaintive chord from the wood harp. That is your loss, he said. Who is the finest singer you've ever heard? Earlier of Bravos, Sir Roderick answered at once. Oh, I'm much better than that old stick, Marillion said. If you have a silver for a song, I'll gladly show you. I might have a copper or two, but I'd sooner toss it down a well than pay for your howling, Sir Roderick groused. His opinion of singers was well known. Music was a lovely thing for girls, but he could not comprehend why any healthy boy would fill his hand with a harp when he might have had a sword. "'Your grandfather has a sour nature,' Marillion said to Catelyn. "'I meant to do you honor, an homage to your beauty. In truth, I was made to sing for kings and high lords.' "'Oh, I can see that,' Catelyn said. "'Lord Tully is fond of song, I hear.' No doubt you've been to River Run. A hundred times, the singer said airily. They keep a chamber for me, and the young lord is like a brother. Catelyn smiled, wondering what Edmure would think of that. Another singer had once betted a girl her brother fancied. He had hated the breed ever since. And Winterfell? she asked him. Have you traveled north? Why would I? Marillion asked. It's all blizzards and bearskins up there, and the stocks know no music but the howling of wolves. 
Distantly, she would she was aware of the door banging open at the far end of the room. Inkeep, a servant's voice called out behind her. We have horses that want stabling, and my lord of Lannister requires a room and a hot bath. Oh, gods, Sir Roderick said before Catelyn reached out to silence him, her fingers tightening hard around his forearm. Masha Heddell was bowing and smiling her hideous smile. I'm sorry, my lord. Truly, we're full up. Every room. There were four of them, Catelyn saw. An old man in the black of the night's watch, two servants, and him, standing there small and bold as life. My men will sleep in your stable, and for myself, well, I do not require a large room, as you can plainly see. He flashed a mocking grin. So long as the fire's warm and the straw reasonably free of fleas, I am a happy man. Masha Heddle was beside herself. My lord, there's nothing. It's the tourney. There's no help for it, oh. Tyrion Lannister pulled a coin from his purse and flicked it up over his head, caught it, tossed it again. Even across the room, where Catelyn sat, the wink of gold was unmistakable. A free rider in a faded blue cloak t- lurched to his feet. You're welcome to my room, my lord. Now there's a clever man, Lannister said as he sent the coin spinning across the room. The free rider snatched it from the air. And a nimble one to boot. The dwarf turned back to Masha Heddle. You will be able to manage food, I trust. Anything you like, my lord. Anything at all, the innkeep promised. And may he choke on it, Catelyn thought. But it was Bran she saw choking, drowning in his own blood. Lannister glanced at the nearest tables. Uh, my men will have whatever you're serving these people. Double portions. We've had a long ride. I'll take a roast fowl. Chicken, duck, pigeon, it makes no matter. And send up a flagon of your best wine. Yorin, will you sup with me? I am lord, I will, the black brother replied. The dwarf had not so much as glanced towards the far end of the room, and Catelyn was thinking how grateful she was for the crowded benches between them when suddenly Marillion bounded to his feet. My lord of Lannister, he called out. I would be pleased to entertain you while you eat. Let me sing you the lay of your father's great victory at King's Landing. Nothing would be more likely to ruin my supper, the dwarf said dryly. His mismatched eyes considered the singer briefly, started to move away, and found Catelyn. He looked at her for a moment, puzzled. She turned her face away, but too late. The dwarf was smiling. Lady Stark, an unexpected pleasure he said. I was sorry to miss you at Winterfell. Marillion gaped at her, confusion giving way to chagrin as Catelyn rose slowly to her feet. She heard Sir Roderick curse. If only the man had lingered at the wall, she thought. If only. Lady Stark? Masha Heddle said thickly. I was still Catelyn Tully the last time I bedded here, she told the innkeep. She could hear the muttering, feel the eyes upon her. Catelyn glanced around the room at the faces of the knights and sworn swords and took a deep breath to slow the frantic beating of her heart. Did she dare take the risk? There was no time to think it through, only the moment and the sound of her own voice ringing in her ears. You, in the corner, she said to an older man she had not noticed until now. Is that the black bat of Harrenhal I see embroidered on your surcoat, sir? The man got to his feet. It is, my lady. And his lady went, a true and honest friend to my father, Lord Hoster Tully of River Run? She is, the man replied stoutly. Sir Roderick rose quietly and loosened his sword in its scabbard. The dwarf was blinking at them, blank-faced, with puzzlement in his mismatched eyes. The Red Stallion was ever a welcome sight in River Run, she said to the trio by the fire. My father counts Lord Janos Bracken among his oldest and most loyal bannermen. The three men-at-arms exchanged uncertain looks. Our lord is honored by his trust, one of them said hesitantly. I envy your father all these fine friends, Lannister quipped. "Uh, But I do not quite see the purpose of this, Lady Stark. She ignored him, turning to the large party in blue and gray. They were the heart of the manor. The... There were more than twenty of them. I know your sigil as well. The twin towers of Frey. How fares your good lord, sirs? Their captain rose. 
Lord Welder is well, my lady. He plans to take a new wife on his 90th name day, and has asked your Lord Father to honor the wedding with his presence. Tyrion Lannister sniggered. That was when Catelyn knew he was hers. This man came a guest into my house, and there conspired to murder my son, a boy of seven, she proclaimed to the room at large, pointing. Sir Roderick moved to her side, his sword in hand. In the name of King Robert and the good lords you serve, I call upon you to seize him and help me return him to Winterfell to await the king's justice. She did not know what was more satisfying, the sound of a dozen swords drawn as one, or the look on Tyrion Lannister's face.